Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. James Cresswell. He is Professor of Psychology at Ambrose University, Adjunct Professor at the University of Calgary, Research Associate at the Canadian Poverty Institute, Research Associate at the Newcomer Research Network, and also editor of the Journal of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology. His research interests draw on many sources ranging from cultural psychology to cognitive science and literary theory. And today we're going to talk about a theory and theorizing in psychology, uh, focusing mostly on his paper theories as modern myths, giving up the pursuit of good theory to focus on good theorizing. So Dr. Cresswell, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So my first question will be then, uh, what is a theory? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... I guess when you say what is theory, the, the true answer it's the it's the the terror of every undergraduate student, I suppose. <laughs> right. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, uh, uh, theory is one of the most amorphous concepts in psychology, especially when we look at the history of psychology and we move into kind of the contemporary era, uh, that is post cognitive revolution, nineteen uh, sixties, nineteen seventies cognitive revolution. We kind of stopped talking about theory and really uh, went to a very thin definition of it at the undergraduate level. And the definition is usually something like uh, some sort of predictable result or some sort of predictable description of the world, which is somewhat vague. What is a theory actually is, is uh, quite messy in psychology because really, in the paper you cite, what I noted is that psychologists tend to actually use the word theory to mean three different things. On the one hand, they mean what I would call, and for our purposes, I'll call it big T theory. And big T theory is like the broad philosophical view what Thomas Kuhn taught, called paradigms, these yeah. big kind of philosophical ways in which we shape how we see the world. That's one way we talk about theory. Another way we talk about theory is some sort of area of study. So let's say your theory is uh, you're doing something in the cognitive science of religion, which is based, the cognitive science of religion is like this kind of general area of study yeah. that's situated in this broader philosophical big T paradigm of cognitive science. So there's mm -hmm. a cognitive science perspective. Within it is an area, which we also call theory. Mm -hmm. And then the third way psychologists use theories is we talk about general statements. Right, specific yeah. things like uh, in case of the cognitive science of religion, if you um, if you uh, trigger people's hyperactive agency detection devices and yeah. you trigger th things linked to how we read other people's minds, you get religion. Right, it's a predictable mm -hmm. description of yeah. real small stuff. So there's these three levels of theory, and they each nest within each other. The problem mm -hmm. in psychology is rarely does a psychologist say. This is the theory I'm talking about. It's often very subtle and one has to read very carefully to figure out at which level they're talking about. So there's these three definitions of a theory and it kind of depends on what you're at. My work in theoretical and philosophical psychology is all about big T theory, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I, that's my uh, kind of my, my wheelhouse, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what is the relationship uh, between theory and empirical work are they the same the same thing or not yeah great great question so uh this also gets uh, really murky because psychologists have defined empirical work in a particular way over the last uh, kind of 100 years or so mm -hmm. initially when we talk about empirical work we met like in the time of william james just looking at the world in a disciplined way so you're not just, right. you're looking at the world, you're taking care that your biases or your own desires aren't kind of shaping what you're thinking. It's just a disciplined way of looking. We've transitioned in psychology to refer to empirical as empiricist, meaning we measure something, right? That's kind of the right. dominant way, which is a British empiricism of actually a particular kind of empirical work. So the notion of empirical is very broad. Uh, and you have to say, what kind of empirical are we talking about? 
So the relation between empirical and theory is that that big T theory, that high order, high level stuff, that's the stuff that tells you how to look at the world. That's the stuff that tells you how to do your empirical work. Mm -hmm. So if I'm from the, if I keep using cognitive science of religion for now, is that, is that okay if I keep using no. that example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. I've already yeah. had many cognitive scientists of religion on the show, so there's no problem. Well, Perfect. So uh, the big T theory, let's I'll, I'll call it kind of uh, cognitivism, is an approach to how the mind is a mental processor that takes input processes and does outputs. That's the big T theory. When it comes to doing your empirical work, you then structure your empirical work with that assumption in mind. So I might do a reaction time test to look at mm -hmm. processing time, right? Or mm -hmm. I might do a percent correct or recall test to look at um, biases and cognitions. So the empirical work is informed by the big T theory, mm -hmm. right? And then that, that uh, the relationship is one of kind of synergy or, let me say it this way, our empirical work is meaningful on the basis of that big T theory in which it's situated. And that's the relationship between the those kind of empirical work and the, when we start talking about big T theory. Now, where this gets messy is, of course, empirical work could be, at, you could be talking about empirical in terms of small t predictable statement stuff, mm -hmm. right? The, yeah. That would that would be empirical as well, okay? Mm -hmm. And of course, in science and in psychology in particular, in this case, People look at lots of data, but can data themselves yield up the theories? Is that possible? Yeah. So for a long time in psychology, mostly since behaviorism, we have had the, the mistaken hope that data can speak for themselves. <laughs> and, we had for a lot, and, uh, and that's how psychology actually as a discipline has attempted to avoid a lot of kind of bigger order social questions until quite recently. Mm -hmm. We've tried to avoid questions, uh, issues of racism or systematic injustice and saying, well, we just look at the data. But in fact, data don't yield up theories in themselves because the way in which you interpret the data yeah. uh, is shaped by your big T theory. So right now, uh, this is actually becoming a huge area of discussion in psychology. Quite recently, the American Psychological Association released, released uh, a series of apologies about white epistemologies. And mm -hmm. what they're talking about there is big T theory. That psychology had traditionally used a particular approach that privileged certain populations over others. So people who come from a post-colonial perspective or a decolonial perspective, people who come from a feminist perspective, or maybe someone who comes from post-human disability studies perspective, they're saying, well, wait a second, the data just don't speak for themselves. In fact, your white epistemology shapes how you see the data, right? Or for example, mm -hmm. you take uh, some of the feminist critiques from uh, people like Alex Rutherford at York University, and she points out that, well, look, all of our research, almost all of it, uh, is predicated on a binary system of gender. We put in male or female. Mm -hmm. So that already, how you set up data collection based on your theory uh, predetermines what data you can see. So the, the challenge that psychology is faced right now is that a, a lot of kind of voices that have been marginalized in the past are saying, no, 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 data does not speak for itself. Data is always informed by some sort of big T theory. Hence, we have the, uh, in the American Psychological Association these sorts of concerns with this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we also have it in many other places around the world too. We have this kind of um, movement saying, wait a second, let's pay close attention to our starting big T theory stuff. And uh, that is where we have to start talking about difficult conversations about intersectionality and and how we do data analysis. So in Canada, for example, where I'm at, we're working with indigenous people because they're saying, well, look, your, your approach to, to research and data 
has actually systematically excluded indigenous psychology. In fact, they've even gone so far to point out how we've pathologized indigenous ways of thinking and right. made that part of our own research. So am I saying, by the way, that when I talk about this big take theory and data, I am not saying that any of my colleagues had ill intention. What True. I'm saying is, <laughs> I want to be very careful. What I'm saying is that a lot of times psychology has not had a strong history of talking about big T theory. And so then we just assume data speaks for itself. And that's how we smuggle and hide our biases. Mm -hmm. Yes, th this is very interesting because, uh, I mean, we could look at it in a very simplistic way and say that, for example, if we are looking at numbers, statistics, then they speak for themselves because they are supposedly objective. But And we could go one level up uh, and uh, apply a, ti a tiny, uh, um, a more sophisticated, but not much more sophisticated view of things and say that, uh, yeah, data don't speak for themselves, but uh, there's uh, some sort of th theoretical framework out there that is self-evident. And th that's the the best one. That's the only game in town. And it's self-evident. But I, I mean, even that uh, is very questionable, right? Because ma many times people have this sort of idea that in science, there's only, uh, even if there's different theoretical frameworks across different areas from physics to psychology, for example, within each area, there should be only one theoretical framework that works the best, and that's the one we should uh, work with. Right. Agreed. Well, there, there are two issues at stake here, uh, I think. <laughs> one is that... Uh, um psychology is in principle uh, a bit of a what uh, one author called Dilta referred to as a nexus discipline mm. in that we are we're a discipline where biology uh social cultural stuff anthropology you know psychological phenomena cultural phenomena these things all kind of like meet to understand mm. human psychology right mm -hmm. which actually really amplifies the difficulty of putting together a coherent single science in our discipline. And in fact, I'd argue that if you look at psychology, we're a highly diverse discipline, theoretically. Mm. I, my, my neuroscience colleagues come from a very different place than my social science colleagues because just the complexity of human phenomena, right? So uh, yeah. we, we would love to have one approach, <laughs> but I think <laughs> that uh, those days are gone. I think in the 1990s, we had a massive shift in psychology or a crisis moment where I call the cultural turn, mm -hmm. where suddenly psychology realized that all this work we developed in North America didn't generalize to the rest of the world as well as we thought it did. And mm -hmm. there's this collective panic. And so since that cultural turn, it's been pretty hard to kind of pursue one uh, area in domain of psychology. Psychology is very dynamic and, and yeah. uh, has multiple disciplines. The second issue at stake here is that psychology doesn't necessarily have an object of study, which is very, I, mean, it's, I know it sounds odd, yeah. but I can't say I have some racism in my pocket that I can show you, mm -hmm. or I can, I can pour you a cup of love. Right? I can't do that kind of thing because uh, it's not a tangible, tangible object. Right? And so maybe in another discipline, I could watch chemical interactions. But for humans, uh, a lot of the stuff we care about in psychology, like I can't cut open your brain and see love. I can see neurocorrelates of what we might label as love. And that's the challenge in psychology is that we're often engaging in labeling stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our numbers, for example, are representations. If I get statistical significance, just tells me two populations are different on some measure, I then infer what the meaning is and what those numbers represent. And it's in that inferential step that we end up struggling with this issue of data speaking for themselves. Now, how much does it make, sorry, Ricardo, sensible? Am I not sure? I'm not yeah, sure here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let me just have another comment. I don't know if you agree with this or not, but. Uh, also, many things that are objects of study in psychology, uh, 
sometimes, uh, I mean, even for myself, it's hard for me to understand them as exclusively uh, objects of study in psychology. Because if you look at other areas like other social sciences, for example, like anthropology, sociology, and so on, I mean, you have to get some inputs from them as well if you want to have a more complete understanding or a better understanding of certain aspects of human behavior, human psychology, for example. And uh, you, you've you talked there about co the cognitive science of religion. And for me, it's a very fascinating field because it's very interdisciplinary. And I mean, of course, it is cognitive science but at the same time, you get insights from sociology, anthropology, psychology, neuroscience, evolutionary theory. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't even know if the cognitive science of religion is psychology, anthropology. And I don't think that really matters, right, if it's from one field or the other, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you're exactly right. And cognitive science of religion is the reason I bring it up is it's a great example of a nexus discipline, mm -hmm. right? Where there's lots of things colliding, which in some ways creates immense, uh, immense uh, kind of creative stuff. Yeah. Because when we get the, the what well, we have, for example, in the cognitive science of religion, we have the collision of different big T theories, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you have, for example, someone like Harvey Whitehouse who does very anthropological. You have someone like uh, Sperber, who has an epidemiological approach to culture. Then you have someone like uh, uh, Justin Barrett, who's old school cognitive representational, good old fashioned AI cognitive science, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you, and then you have someone like uh, Bob McCauley, who does like uh, kind of this hybrid stuff, where he tries to be a little bit an activist with a fourie embodied cognition, but then goes back to good old fashioned AI. So you have these collisions of different perspectives, different big T theories, which creates a lot of interesting stuff. But one of the problems that you also see in that moment is unless people are cognitively aware of the impact of their big T theory, they actually can end up um, misrepresenting the data in some ways, right? Or misrepresenting the people, not the data, but the, the phenomena they're talking about. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, in this case, for example, it's very easy in nexus disciplines like that for people to ignore the importance of big T theory. And we see this in psychology all the time. Uh, the most the typical example you see everywhere is in North American psychology, we have this uh, kind of like uh, hostility towards psychoanalysis and people kind of critique Freud. Mm -hmm. Well, psychoanalysis is a big T theory. It's a philosophy. <laughs> and right. if you take psychoanalysis, and you plug it into an, a study formed by, let's say, a cognitive science approach, psychoanalysis will always fail, right? Because it's a different theoretical background. Likewise, right. if you take any cognitive science, let's, let's do the therapeutic program, we do cognitive behavioral therapy, and you test it within the paradigm of psychoanalysis, cognitive behavioral therapy will always fail because these big T theories set the conditions for what counts as good observations and measurement. In places like the cognitive science of religion, where we have a nexus discipline, where lots of stuff is brought together, there's a very high risk that people are misinterpreting what they're trying to say, because blending theories is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So still regarding data, I have a very interesting quote from your paper here. So data cannot be made sensible except by engaging some broad framework of meaning. So what is meaning in this context? Oh, yeah. yeah, good question. Uh, we've been debating the meaning of meaning since Aristotle. So let's, uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to solve it in, uh, in, 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 in 25 seconds here. And that wouldn't be fair. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to give a, a quick, what I call a quick dirty definition. When I articulate and discuss meaning, usually what I mean is it involves two things. Mm -hmm. Meaning involves understandability yeah. or maybe sensibility. Like if I say the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plains, I've made an utterance that is uh, understandable and perhaps sensible to you. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that meaning involves is what I would call relevance or importance. 
So this would be, for example, uh, I just had a really amazing experience. I was in the Canadian Rockies and I happened to see a grizzly bear, which is very rare. And it was a very powerful experience. It was meaningful to me. It was important, not only because I could get eaten, but because it was a very powerful experience to come close <laughs> to an animal like that in the forest. Yeah. Uh, so meaning involves relevance or importance. So when we talk about something being meaningful, we talk about it being understandable and relevant or mm -hmm. sensible and important. And this is what we generally mean by meaning. So where does meaning come from? A lot of times meaning comes out of the big T theories that we have, these broad philosophical frameworks. They, they tell us when I look at a reaction time and look a reaction time test is just milliseconds. Mm -hmm. I have to know how many milliseconds are matter or important and what that millisecond gap means, right? So in a reaction time test, we know that we measure how fast someone responds to infer processing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm making that gap versus a non-gap, maybe in control versus a treatment group. Their reaction times are different. I'm making that understandable. And I'm telling us what's relevant and important about that gap or that difference. And so this is how we, we talk about meaning. So a framework for meaning, this big T theory, it is kind of an orientation to how the world works. Uh, it's kind of like a purview that makes what we see sensible or understandable and helps us understand what's important. So a really good example is if you take a look at and talk to religious believers, how they think about the world is framed in their religious uh, world. Mm -hmm. this kind of worldview, that framework of meaning, that big T theory stuff. And then you take cognitive science of religion and they come along and do their work from a different big T theory. And then you wonder why these two folks can't talk to each other. It's because they have, they can look at the exact same data and they're, they, they see different meanings in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and getting into another uh, question here, so there's this notion of theory, and then there's also descript description. What is the relationship there? Okay, yeah. So when we talk about um, these terms like theory and description, they, they have, again, like theory has a long history, so it's a notion of description, right? Yeah. And often we talk about explanation versus description. That's kind of a traditional discussion in psychology where we align quantitative with uh, explanation and qualitative with uh, description. Yeah. So to describe is, um, you know, to discuss what's there, what's in front of us to describe it. Um, and I'd argue that explanation is a kind of description. In fact, there's some, uh, the, the article you're referring to is actually a response to another article by a gentleman named Mills. Mm -hmm. And Mills points out how description and explanation actually kind of overlap a lot. They're not so separate. So what theory does is it enables us to have kind of a framework by which we can describe or explain something, right? So if I want to describe why people worship their ancestors, explain why they worship their ancestors, my framework of cognitive science of religion, uh, cognitive science in general, maybe evolutionary psychology, it allows me to provide a meaningful description for psychologists involved in this type of work, right? Yeah. It, 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 it works for them. So theory is often the, um, uh, the, the thing that, big key theory is often the thing that shapes what description expression is. Multi theory, the other two types that I was talking about, mm -hmm. that would be a description and or explanation depending on the context that you're working. So it's very old muddy waters here, I'm sorry, but it is uh, in you know, T theory informs what counts good description. Mm -hmm. If I, for example, if I'm a cultural psychologist and uh, I go to a cognitive science group and I use a cultural explanation, it's nonsensical to them, right? Uh, just doesn't work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
Yeah, uh, but going back to the very title of your paper, Theories as Modern Myth. So what yes. is a myth exactly? Because people might, might get the wrong idea that you're making here a case for something that is just invented and has no correspondence with reality <laughs> whatsoever. That is the common usage of the term myth, I guess. So. I'll, I'd have to say uh, guilty as charged. I was being a little bit cheeky with the title. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not gonna well, okay, so my observation was not entirely off the mark. I guess. Not entirely off the mark, uh, uh, but but you know how things work, right? People read an article yeah. with a nice title. Yeah, <laughs> more than yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah completely understandable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let, let me let me start off with this. Uh, I'm responding to the, uh, John Mills' paper on myth, and uh, what he points out that it was just absolutely brilliant from my perspective was that a myth is not a silly story that's a lie so mm -hmm. often we use myth in this kind of insulting notion right if i if i say myth is uh you know the, i don't know the, the myth of santa claus or myth of whatever one, one believes in yeah. we often we think of it sometimes as being like a dismissive thing where we kind of uh, treat it as a falsehood or a convenient silly little story. Yeah. Now that is discussed, myth can be discussed in that way, but when we look at myth, like yeah. religious myth um, or all, all sorts of types of stories or myths, these things um, are clearly not a factual account. Right, like you look at the Epic of Gilgamesh or something like that. We're not talking about a factual account. However, what people miss about the notion of myth is that they're not, they might not be a factual account, like a textbook account of something, but they're also not just a silly story. They're not just a story that we make. We keep telling these stories because they're meaningful to us. Then they make the world make sense. Like a religious myth explains why people do X, Y, or Z, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it tells us how their information should be meaningful. So a myth is neither a silly story, nor is it a factual account. However, what a myth does is, um, if you look very carefully at them, they tell us about how people think the world works. Right? So if I talk about the myth of some religious figure, uh, I won't name names or if I pick the myth of some religious figure, what I'm doing is not saying it's a silly story. I'm not saying it's a factual account, but I am saying it's something we need to pay attention to very closely because it tells us something about ourselves. So um, a myth of some sort might be a story but then you ask, what does that mean? Why do we keep telling these things for thousands of years? Like, what is it about the myth of Santa Claus that we keep telling it? <laughs> and we mm. keep using it. Is Santa real? Well, if he is, I'm in trouble, but Santa may not be real. But yet it has some sort of, it, it, it makes something understandable. You know, it, it kind of makes sense. So myths are very important stories. And what I try to do in the article is point out that myths are wound up with big T theory. Mm -hmm. So if I come from a religious perspective, that's my big T theory. It's going to shape how I interpret the world. If I understand someone's behavior, I'm going to say, oh, yeah, they're like this character in this story in the whatever religious text. Yeah. Um, it, so myth, it, it, we can understand it with religion. And what I'm pointing out is that something similar happens in science, that if we're psychoanalytic, come from a psychoanalytic mythology or a philosophy, big T theory, we're going to frame and understand things a certain way. And, if we, and I'm, many psychologists in North America would be very happy with calling psychoanalysis a myth, right? In fact, I've seen undergrad textbooks do this, but they mean it in that lie way. But I'm going to say, no, no, it's not necessarily, uh, necessarily a factual account, but it's a philosophical orientation. If I come from a different myth, like about statistical positivism, how statistics can give us truth and tell us about the world or tell us about general covering laws, that mythology, I'm saying, is very meaningful. 
So what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do with calling theory as myth is both rescue the notion of myth <laughs> and point out that there's a way in which we as psychologists can get caught up in our own mythology. For mm -hmm. example, this mythology of psychology is the progress of science which was fine until the cultural turn of the 1990s. It was fine until the replication crisis that we just were apparently coming through. And it was fine until what I call the inc inclusion crisis, where we see marginalized voices pushing back and saying, wait a second, your mythology uh, doesn't match our, <laughs> our mythology. So I'm trying to raise this issue because we don't want to get rid of myth or scientific theories, but the danger is when we don't see them and they implicitly drive us. And that's that, especially in current conversations, this is where this is becoming a big issue. Mm -hmm. right? so yeah, how, how and, we... and we'll come back to the replication crisis and the inclusion <laughs> crisis later on in our conversation. But I think that this leads us to another very important uh, question. So in terms of our philosophical slash ontological conditions, the conditions we use uh, for the truth, where do we derive them from exactly? How do we set them up? Yeah, well, so I think most people who study theory uh, would say that the, this big T theory um, or the big T theories are historical phenomena. Mm -hmm. That is, they're shaped by communities and groups, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of a collective production or a collective social representation. So what the critics in the kind of 1990s, people like Kirk Danzinger pointed out, uh, he has a beautiful book called Constructing the Subject, which is an elegant useful book to read for everybody from the 1990s. And in mm -hmm. Constructing the Subject, he shows how this idea that the, the notion of psychology is a scientific discipline, how that kind of orientation of the mind as a computer and the mind as a processor, how that big T theory emerged, right, mm -hmm. socially, right? So. Mm -hmm. Theoretical psychologists point out that, well, it, you know, we, we get the kind of model cognition we have right now because what was going on at the time in the culture, right? So we have mm -hmm. people like Minsky and even Bruner, early cognitive scientists. They're, they're building, you know, all these theories based on the fact that computers became available. <laughs> and so there's this big T theory is tied into these broad social movements. Psychoanalysis, of course, is the same thing. Behaviorism, uh, James and, and Pierce and pragmatism. A lot of these big T theories emerge out of kind of historical space where they're in. And the um, thing that uh, we build these frameworks and um, over time, what happens is, you know, people kind of, it's easy to look back 100 years ago and talk about pragmatism than is to talk about a current theory because mm -hmm. often on the ground they're quite messy and they, they blend. Um, but where do we get new innovations in psychology? Well, in psychology we see new innovations not necessarily when we find a new experiment but rather the paradigm shifts. So we have in, in you know we have pragmatism and kind of structuralism or early psychology and this desperate need in America at the time for social engineering and behaviorism came along yeah. and was a massive paradigm shift, was a massive big T theory shift, and that's where we get a bunch of innovation. And then we realized after a while that there's something missing here, Some, something about the, something's not working right. And then researchers come along and they shift to another big T theory, which could be, say, the cognitive revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get these massive shifts and uh, these kind of theoretical shifts are, are, are when something usually isn't working very well and we don't know what to do and then we get a theoretical shift and we can look back at our data in a new light, right? So they, a lot of our theorizing is deeply entwined with what's going on in the culture. So if you watch psychology, psychology journals, you see some people in, in, the, in the contemporary culture talking about meditation and mindfulness. 
And then you see the journals five years later track along. So they get an explosion yeah. of articles on mindfulness, right? right? You see the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. You, you see um, kind of um, a stronger representation of diverse non-heteronormative lifestyles. Uh, you see kind of movements and kind of like rethinking gender. And then psychology follows along <laughs> five, ten years later in the journal articles because these broad big T theories are tied into, we're not separate from the world mm -hmm. like we wish we were, right? We're scientists that are part of the world. And, and talking about this sort of broader cultural context, what about the sociolinguistic practices of a particular community? Does it make sense to separate scientific theories from them? Yeah, now this is kind of, uh, let me dark, just unpack this term social linguistic practices because it's, yes. uh, it is a, uh, it is one of these terms that is like an ideological grenade, right? You get people really reactive <laughs> with these terms. <laughs> yeah. But when we talk about social linguistic practices, in a general way, we're talking about uh, like language does something, it's a symbol. Right? Mm -hmm. Language is, is, are symbols, they're meaningful symbols. And so they are meaningful symbols shared by a group of people. Right. right. So for example, I speak English fairly well, but if I go down the hallway, I'm at my institution right now, and I, I talk to the, the IT gentleman, the guy in the desk there who works with IT, and I ask him about my computer, he'll respond to me using English, but I have no clue what those <laughs> symbols mean. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think that we're all familiar with that kind of situation. <laughs> exactly, because we get genres or, or communities in psychology that use certain clusters of representation. Mm -hmm. Right. So, well, I, I, for example, part another part of my job we haven't talked about. I do work with high performance athletes, and high performance athletes have a very particular way of talking about the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I if I walk in, I talk about ontology. <laughs> it's going nowhere. <laughs> it's, no, just forget it. <laughs> yeah, forget it. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So what happens is these different, even though they may be all English speakers, these different kind of communities or genres they're called yeah. have certain ways of using language that represent the world, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they're called sociolinguistic or communal linguistic. Right. Now it turns out that these communal linguistics, these little ways, genres of ways of talking, they're really embedded in like big T theory, right? Mm -hmm. So be because of cognitive science, we can all talk about mental processing. We use the word processing all the time to talk about humans. Like my students all the time, they say, oh, I'm processing that. Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't talk like that if it wasn't for that particular community <laughs> shaping how we think about mind. Yeah. So um, another example would be in psychology for generations we studied males versus females in our studies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's a particular sociolinguistic practice. And the feminist uh, critique comes along and they say, wait a second, your way of framing and talking about gender already shapes what gender can be. And you've you know, mm -hmm. cut it short. So the problem that we have to grapple with now in psychology is that we, we actually can't talk about scientific theories separate from these mm -hmm. social linguistic practices, especially because at some point we have to tell somebody what we found. <laughs> we have to tell someone what our research is about. And when we're doing that, we're using language, right? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've noticed this, for example, um, in the cognitive science of religion, if someone starts to talk to religious believers about religion, it, it actually is completely nonsensical, right? It, it just mm -hmm. doesn't land. And then if religious believers try and talk to someone in cognitive science, it doesn't land either because we're talking about two different big T theories that have a different different types of science, if you would, right? Yeah, it, it's, so it's, it's almost the same as uh, people who come from two different societies with different norms completely talking past each other because they don't understand each other's behavior at all, at all right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so what we do in theoretical psychology is try and deal with these different vocabularies, so to speak. Yeah. So my job, like I, I'll look at kind of James's notion of pragmatism, how he talked about science and how a current psychologist will talk about science. Mm 
-hmm. and their different languages, where they lap, uh, where they overlap, and where they diverge. Right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, this is what we're working on in psychology is actually grappling with this in a way that we haven't had to yet. Mm -hmm. But so we know that it's hard for scientists and specifically in this case psychologists to look critically at the mm -hmm. theories that dominate their own field or subfield. But do we know why that happens? <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you a story. I, I remember a number of years ago as, as a graduate st uh, student, so six million years ago, I was a grad student, and I was at a conference, and there was a presenter at that conference who was coming from a radically different paradigm or, or big T theory than the rest of the people at the conference. And he's presenting. And I watched with horror as people in the audience began to heckle the person. <laughs> oh my God. I thought, this, as a grad student, this, this terrified me to see academics heckling each other, right? Yeah. And I thought, what did I learn a lesson at that moment? Which is that when uh you're within a particular paradigm a particular big t theory they really shape and they're part of who you are and that's the difficulty so mm -hmm. we look back and we can look in judgment at the behaviors like we, you can look at for example watson and the disaster of a parent that he was <laughs> and you say why well, and you, there's, you historically can take a look at the his, the whole thing that happened there and what happened when he implemented his principles at home Mm -hmm. But Watson was his theory. Right? The way he thought and saw the world was deeply tied to his, his theory that he had. Because yeah. uh, these theories become integral to us. Because, and this is why your question is so great. It's because these large big T theories, these big philosophical perspectives, they shape what we think is real. Right? They, they shape what we take for granted. Just like people from different cultures, you know, see different worlds. So when we challenge reality, and like, like I saw this conference, what happens when you challenge someone's reality? Well, they, yeah. they respond, right? <laughs> if, I mean, if you, 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 can, you can see this, the poor people, researchers in the cognitive science of religion, this happens to them all, them all the time. When I was working with some CSR folks, I would get email from random folks that were just diatribes about how I was attacking their faith and that sort of thing, because, and it happens with scientists too. I've been mm -hmm. at conferences, like I've told you, and seen when someone's worldview is attacked. Um, so one of the, the problems is that these, when you start messing with these broad philosophical myths or big T theories, you're messing with how people see the world. Mm -hmm. that, that is tough, even scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Now what magnifies that issue in psychology is that because we've had a long tradition of not really focusing on theory, big T theory, or being careful in our discussion at the undergrad level especially, um, we've ended up with um, a very kind of um, impoverished way of thinking in psychology about theory. So what happens is uh, if I, I'm on a, so I, I'm participating in several interdisciplinary research groups, mm -hmm. and uh, my colleagues there just don't think about theory, right? They're not trained to think about theory, and, and you, for example, they're told now they have to integrate decolonial stuff into their curriculum. Mm -hmm. They know nothing about how to work with a brand new theoretical big T theory, because they're they're kind of locked within what they've they've done in the past, and that's just a problem with training. So we need to really in psychology shift to do what other disciplines have done, which is take on the problem of kind of big T theory. Like you look at, like every sociology undergrad curriculum was required to take a sociology of theory, at least one. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen an undergraduate theory of psychology course. Uh, and you see the odd history of psychology course, but very rarely. So that one of the biggest problems we have in psychology is that we're actually we're required now with this kind of challenge to deal with different worldviews, we're required to talk about big T theory, and a lot of us just don't have the skills or training to do it. That mm -hmm. means that, of course, 
It's very hard to do it. And it's very hard to be critical about it and reasonably and justifiably so. If you've received no training in an area, like theoretical psychology, if you look into American psychologists, uh, people like Slife and Williams wrote a beautiful article about the discipline of theoretical psychology. They articulate how it's, a, it's its own discipline, its own skill set, right? You can't expect someone to know how to do this stuff without some sort of training. So we need to kind of rethink how we train and educate psychologists, um, mm -hmm. talk about it. And that, that's why it's so hard for psychologists is one, theories are tied to who we are, and two, just we just don't have sufficient training on how to think about theory uh, to kind of be critically self-reflexive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really why I like this analogy with uh, people from different societies that have different norms, different practices, different moral values, because I, I mean, just observing how people react, for example, to a different set of norms, to different behaviors, it's very much evident that it's very easy for people to be very critical of something that falls outside of their set of uh, values, set of norms, but when it comes to their own set of norms, uh, I mean, for them, it's just obvious. It's just the way the world is and how the world works and how society functions, and there's nothing yeah. to really uh, be critical of there. Right. I agree. I, I want to add one little uh, caveat. I think there mm -hmm. yeah, I want. Yeah. It's really important to realize that when people are working within a big T theory, and maybe it might have some sort of devastating effect, mm -hmm. um, I am not saying we should not say that our colleagues were intentionally evil. Oh, there was, yeah, in, the 19, sure. in the 1960s, uh, we thought eugenics, sterilizing people, was a great idea, right? We also thought that here in Canada, we were giving people a lot of acid because we figured if we got them stoned, we could backwards engineer it and figure out how to cure schizophrenia. <laughs> These seemed like great ideas that we now look back on and think, what were we thinking? They're com they were really well-intentioned at the time. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of my colleagues that I deal with in psychology really want to do good work, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, they're and they're acting in good conscience. Um, so I really want to add that caveat and uh, right. uh, and, and kind of like um, recognize that mistakes we made. We need to talk about theory, like different norms, different values from different communities. That's fine. But what we don't want to do is necessarily throw in a moral judgment because uh, the best science of the time is the best science of the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, and I have another quote here from your article. Um, and I think that you've already touched a little bit on this earlier in our conversation, but um, ontological presuppositions made by academics are similar in quality to the lived experiential theories in practice all over everyday life. So could you explain this? Oh, sure thing. Yeah, that, that you can tell that's a sentence written by a theoretical psychologist mm -hmm. and not uh, <laughs> not a normal human being, that's for sure. <laughs> let me let me unpack the very first word, which is ontological, if I could. All right. Yeah, the sure. notion of ontology means being or what we think is kind of real. And uh, when I talk about ontological presuppositions, it's what we think is real. So, for example, if I'm a psychoanalytic, per, per, come from a psychoanalytic perspective, I'm going to think certain things about, you know, psychic conflict, desires, a reality principle, pleasure, you know, wanting pleasure, being restricted. I'm just going to assume those things are real. That is, they're part of my ontology, right? Mm -hmm. And so the ontol we all have a lot of assumptions or presuppositions about what we think is real. And in everyday life, we have to have them. So let's let's do a bit of an exercise here. Um, I'm going to hold up a, a uh, hold up something. And you you just tell me what it is. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. It's a phone, cell phone. It's a phone. Everyone knows it's a phone, right? Yeah. Now, what happens to you? Of course, we know this in psychology is that you get a whole bunch of stimuli hitting your eyeball, right? Yeah. And, uh, 
and a whole bunch, and it's actually upside down, and you have to flip it over, and you put all the stimuli together to create an object. Mm -hmm. So humans are always kind of forming objects and constituting objects. Now, a lot of the objects that we form are these really nebulous things like someone's personality. My partner gets up this morning, and uh, maybe the, uh, I was up a little bit early, and I was banging around. My partner gets up. And they say, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're kind of grouchy this morning, they say to me or something, right? <laughs> the object they're forming is what kind of person I am, right? My grouchiness. Mm -hmm. We're always inferring, um, we have all these theories about what someone is, how they're acting, what's good or bad, whatever. We're always shaping our understanding of the world using these big theories that provide our ontology. Mm -hmm. And what we do in everyday life is also very similar to what like, researchers do. Researchers have presuppositions. They have what the world is. We see this with different movements in psychology about how mm -hmm. the world works. So what uh, early theoretical psychologists in the 1980s uh, and then into the 1990s really showed us was how psychologists, what we do implicitly in the research lab is actually very similar in process to what people do in everyday life. And it's not as sterile sterile or separate. It is a social phenomenon. This this goes back to a 1967, I think, article by Gergen, where he wrote Social Psychology is History. It was a very powerful kind of article that started the social psychology crisis. And like most crises in psychology, we have the crisis and then we kind of forget about it. So that's <laughs> that started that whole crisis. <laughs> and he uh, and he, his whole point was that, you know what, the research situation is actually not as separate from everyday life as we think it is. So. Mm -hmm. And something we haven't touched on yet is uh, we talked about theory, but there are different uses of a theory. Like, for example, the philosophical slash ontological grounding on the one hand, on the other hand, a field of study within such a grounding and also a testable prediction within the field of study. So why is it important to distinguish between these three types of yeah. uses of theory? So when I'm answering this question about why it's important, we're now talking about my issue here, okay? This might be a me problem, but I would argue <laughs> that it's also psychologists more broadly. It's really important to distinguish because when we're not careful about what we mean by theory, um, we can end up smuggling in bias or mm -hmm. smuggling in assumptions. And... Um, when we talk about uh, theory, uh, you know, field of study or testable predictions, they're always grounded in a broader kind of ontological or what I've been calling big T theories. Um, and it's really important we make this distinction now because psychology is kind of in a situation where it's being held to account for ways in which we just didn't pay attention to our big T theory in the past and it had disastrous consequences. Mm -hmm. For example, the whole history of intelligence testing. When we now, uh, people, most people are pretty comfortable with the fact that intelligence testing measures aptitude within a particular socioeconomic status, right? Mm -hmm. and, and racial status. Intelligence works really, intelligence testing works well there. And not really thinking about kind of broader philosophical presumptions from where we come from allowed us to use all these intelligence tests, for example, to determine who we were going to sterilize, right? Or to determine mm -hmm. who was going to be uh, ostracized. Yeah. So not thinking about these broader backgrounds, psychology is kind of being forced into a space where we now have to think about it. Um, and that's why it's important to make this distinction. Uh, you know, I've been teaching for a million years now and uh, researching for a long time and psychology this is the first time in my career where I've seen active conversations about the big philosophical backgrounds. So I find myself brought into conversations as a theoretical and historical psychologist that never would have happened 20 years ago. And it's precisely because making this distinction is 
raising important, important questions that psychologists have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. But then what is a falsifiable claim exactly? Yeah, yeah, good point. So <laughs> this is the exact problem or challenge that happens when we get into theoretical psychology. Because as I mentioned before, if I take psychoanalysis and I test it according to a cognitive paradigm, it'll always fail. Mm -hmm. If I take, and likewise, if I take cognitive science, and I test it in psychoanalytic, you know, some, uh, uh, let's say for example, you know, I, I spend some, I work with colleagues in Latin America and I was invited to a keynote and a presentation down there. And I talked for 20 minutes explaining psychoanalysis. And I looked at my audience and they were terminally bored because of this area. <laughs> And, and, and this happened to be in Brazil, everybody knows psychoanalysis and it's just accepted. And there's this heavy critique of cognitive science, right? Because you take cognitive science into psychoanalysis and they're like, oh, that, that stuff's terrible. So um, what you can't do is decide which is true on the basis of a scientific test. Because a scientific test is nested within a particular paradigm. Mm. So a, a, or a particular big T theory. Right. So a falsifiable claim is something that sit, is situated within a big T theory, right? So what counts as falsifiable in psychoanalysis is gonna be different than what counts as a falsifiable claim in cognitive science. Mm -hmm. So um, when we make, you know, small t theory research area or a particular or in particular uh, description of relation between variables. These are scientific posits and they can be falsified according to the criteria by the framework within which it's working. And what was fascinating is that we're now having to figure out what do we do in psychology when we just can't go to a test. How do we deal with the fact that the feminists are saying this, the decolonial psychologists are saying that, and the indigenous psychologists are saying something else, and we have these tensions that can't be resolved with the test? Well, that's where theoretical psychology comes in. And we stop saying, okay, uh, is it false or true? But rather we think about, does the, we have maybe two or three big T theories, what do we learn through them? And what are their outcomes? What happens when we, they work within these philosophical positions. Mm -hmm. And what's quite ironic is that this particular issue in practice, the struggle with falsifiability, was absolutely core to William James. <laughs> this was <laughs> William James as the founder of psychology was really quite uh, worked up about how do we deal with different perspectives. And this is where he came up with philosophical pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And of course, we kind of forgot about James, and it's quite ironic that we're coming back to the founder yeah. 120 years later, <laughs> so to speak. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's really interesting. So, uh, but we've talked about uh, myths earlier, but uh, mm -hmm. just to perhaps summarize things a little bit here before we move on to another topic, in what ways are theories similar to myths? Well, in the article you're referring to, I actually try to equate them. And mm -hmm. I say that they're very much the same thing, uh, which is where I'm, I'm being cheeky, right? Of course, uh, <laughs> as to uh, try and make uh, us think about theories as myths. Because um, the reason I try to equate the two things, uh, these two ideas, is that I, I want us to take theory seriously, which a lot of people mm -hmm. do. But I also want to be a little bit critical. Like learn to be more, I would like psychologists to be learn to be more critical of their theories, right? Big T theory. Mm -hmm. And this is why I equate the two. And uh, now, I think in that article there, it's a short article. Um, I suspect there are probably very good critiques of uh, why I shouldn't call theory and myth the same thing and say it's the same mm -hmm. phenomena. Um, but I'll leave that to my critics, and I'm very happy uh, to actually receive, because I think some more fine grained distinctions need to be made. Mm -hmm. But for the purposes of what we're talking about today, I tried to blend them as a way to get foster critical reflection, but also you know, take some of the stuff really seriously. Mm -hmm. And so now to refer to the subtitle of your article, uh, what is 
uh, theorizing. What does it mean and uh, how does it differ from theory? Yeah, yeah. So the reason I, I uh, raise this issue of theorizing mm -hmm. is that in psychology, we are often trained to think like psychologists. Okay, not a big surprise, but we are trained to think like psychologists. And what we do in the academic world is we're often trained to think in abstract terms. That is, mm -hmm. I can sit and I can talk about my theory, or I can talk about, uh, you know, cognitive science of religion, or I can talk about feminism. I can do it in this kind of like big abstract world <laughs> where everyone, you know, it, it's, it's a fun kind of game. Yeah. Uh, that's often what we do with theory. And then I go back to my lab and I, <laughs> study <laughs> yeah. and so yeah. when i i raise the term theorizing because i want to get at this idea that actually these things aren't just abstract they're in how i act right so i do i work with kind of newcomers and i have to be i have to realize that there are certain theories of privilege and power that come with my social and racial positioning right mm -hmm. and they're in my action right uh and so i'm trying to get at how theorizing involves our activity but i also want to get at the idea about look we've got to start thinking about our actions in light of big t theory mm -hmm. and thinking about how these things actually impact our day-to-day -day life and mm -hmm what i'm trying to provoke is actually taking some time to think about what um good theory is and how do you decide between the two if you can't decide between psychoanalysis and, and cognitive psychology well how uh how do you weigh it right and that's what theoretical psychology does so theorizing on the one hand is about practical activity how our theories show up in praxis mm -hmm. on the other hand Theorizing is about dealing with these kind of different philosophical areas. And so I've outlined um, in other work how good, good theoretical work is purposeful. You're dealing with some sort of problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> and if I'm looking at, the, let's say I'm looking at Trumpism in America, well, if I take a Lacanian psychoanalytic perspective as opposed to a uh, let's say a uh, post-colonial theorist perspective well how are we dealing with the problem how are mm -hmm. these two approaches helping us understand trumpism in america right mm -hmm. or synthetic uh the good theory theoretical psychology is synthetic that is it looks at different big t theories okay and mm -hmm. it's flexible that is we deal with different theories and so in theoretical psychology we talk about like, for example, I'm doing work which brings together psychoanalysis and stoic philosophy to talk about mm -hmm. disciplines of, of critical reflection. Right. That's kind of good theories trying to bring these things together to get some generative ideas. And it's with a theory is about working with a framework, theorizing is about dealing with these kind of different perspectives. So uh, what I'm arguing for is that we uh, learn to be much more aware of this big picture stuff in its actions, and then how we can actually leverage and work with it mm -hmm. in a more effective way. And so these theorizing also includes theorizing about methods and methodologies, correct? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the activity, the method, what you do, mm -hmm. is influenced by your theory. So if I'm a psychoanalytic researcher, I, I may do it all in therapy and I'll sit behind the person, have them free associate and yell at them when they stop. Or, you know, there's this classic story of Freud slamming his hand and shouting resistance at his patients. Maybe that's how I collect data. <laughs> if I'm a psychoanalytic, that's my method. If I'm, if I'm in cognitive science or religion, I'm going to look at uh, how fast people respond to uh, certain representations of a God figure, maybe, or a, um, yeah. a minimally or maximally counterintuitive uh, concept you know mm -hmm. so our method of course is shaped our actions are shaped by the theory from which we work we work okay mm -hmm. and with all of this in mind do you think it still makes sense for people to look for an ideal theory 
Yeah. There's a, a beautiful idea uh, uh, written by a gentleman named Ta uh, Charles Taylor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he writes that certain things are what he calls telic concepts. And a telic concept uh, comes with this notion of telos, this idea mm -hmm. that you're reaching towards something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But sometimes there are some things that we need to reach towards that we'll probably never get. Um, so I think it is important to look for ideal theory. And right now, psychology is in a situation where we're being really pushed to rethink theory. Um, and it's our job to develop good theory. The problem we have in psychology is the hubris that comes when we think we've got it. We now, the, the, the arrogance to say, yes, we've got it. And we see this all over science. In, in physics, you see, you know, the old Newtonian, the Einsteinian, and string theory. The, the, we should always be striving for ideal, but it's probably a problem if we actually think we've got the ideal. Because then, then you're closing down innovation. And science is about humility and innovation yeah. as much as it is about knowledge. So we, it's a telic concept. It's, it's something we strive for, but there's a very serious danger. Uh, and this is the this is the history of colonization, where we said, "Yeah, we've got it. Yeah. We know what the truth is, <laughs> and we know the." And it went badly for certain people, right? So it's about hanging our truth claims low, but still doing work to push towards ideal theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that we're learning now, bit by bit, how important it is to have people from different cultural backgrounds participating in the process of producing science, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is where we see uh, current emergence of work where people are talking about, um, for example, uh, if you're doing work with indigenous populations, you know, you don't just come in and give them a survey and go away. You spend time with the elders, you work with the elders, you find out what works, what they want, what they don't need. I do a lot of community-based research as well as my theoretical stuff, and that was really about going to a community, talking to them, finding out what they want or need, and then um, kind of going back and working kind of with them in a much more collaborative way, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of what psychology is being called to do. Yeah. So in this process of theorizing, what does it mean exactly to be an insider or an outsider? Yeah, great, great question. Remember when we talked about theoretical perspectives shaping how we see the world? Mm -hmm. So if I am somebody who comes from, let's say, the cognitive science of religion, I may know that whole community and how they talk and think and how they talk about representations and processing. And someone can say the word had, I know exactly what they're talking about, the hyperactive agency detection device, right? Or they can talk about Tom, theory of mind. Yeah. Um, if I'm part of that community, I take for granted what they take for granted. I understand the symbols, the language, the words, and the same data It means the same thing in the same way. That means I'm an insider. Right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was not an insider. For example, the cognitive science religion a number of years ago, I was brought, uh, became part of a research team. And I think I was brought in as the culture guy because <laughs> I needed some <laughs> new culture. <laughs> and, and I was deaf and outsider. I had to spend uh, almost eight months reading about the history of cognitive science because I've been trained in theoretical, philosophical psychology, a lot in cultural psychology. I didn't know anything about cognitive science. And here I am in this group. So I was an outsider and I had to kind of learn the ontological or the being or the big T theory that they're operating within. Right? Mm -hmm. So ideally, someone who's a good theoretical psychologist, and I think most psychologists would work on this skill, is learning how to be an insider in radically different communities. Right. So mm -hmm. for example, I would say here in Canada, we're asking to meaningfully incorporate indigenous information into our curriculum. So I would suggest that a lot of my psychology colleagues, we need, and myself as well, we need to learn how to think like an indigenous perspective, think through an indigenous perspective and really understand it, right? Become, a, right now we're outsiders to it and we need to become insiders to it. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's about kind of becoming familiar with a culture to use the analogy you brought up earlier. It's like kind of becoming intercultural. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so it's possible to become both an insider and an outsider at the same time? Well, that's, what you, that's the ideal that you hope for, because mm -hmm. that's where we get really great innovation, right? An earlier uh, theorist who tried to specify methods in theoretical psychology is Kukla, and he, uh, he pointed out that when you're able to kind of comprehend more than one big T theory, it means you're not locked into a certain way of seeing mm -hmm. and you can actually get innovation. And that's what happened. You look in the cognitive revolution, it was a massive rupture because we had people who are messing around with linguistics, right? We have people who are yeah. messing around with cognitive science and, and cybernetics, and especially in the 1970s. Yeah. And the, the juxtaposition is big T theories is where we get lots of innovation and you hope that people, mm -hmm. Now, here's a problem. It's some ways easier to stick within your own wheelhouse, right? If I'm a social psychologist, I can do a whole bunch of stuff on ide uh, social identity, publish, 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 publish. And we have, you can kind of produce your own career that way. However, it's, uh, it's, it's important to also kind of take these really risky moves to be able to be both an outsider and an insider. And that's what theoretical psychology is about, is about playing with these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So just before we get into the replication crisis, I have one, just one more quote here that I would like you to comment on. Um, my position is that theorizing is done well when it ju juxtaposes theories slash myths in a way that is generative and fosters innovation. So basically, how do you think we can achieve that? So that, that quote is actually really articulating what I just said, right? Mm -hmm. when, um, when one can think through more than one perspective, you're not locked into a certain way of seeing the world. And that's where mm -hmm. we get innovation, right? So mm -hmm. if I try and bring together what's current, there's a move, current movement called liberatory psychoanalysis, which is about using psychoanalysis to help uh, people see way which they've unconsciously picked up kind of ways of thinking that oppress them. Mm -hmm. If I combine that with, let's say, Stoic philosophy, which is also about critically thinking and examining oneself, mm -hmm. I can get something really innovative that comes out of that. And so theorizing, I am saying good theorizing is when we actually can generate ideas and break out of the same study over and over and over again. And we, we, this is a long-standing discussion in psychology where you get someone who kind of publishes the same study over and over again. They just change a variable every study, which is fine <laughs> because it's developing knowledge of some sort. But there, it's, people also criticize it for kind of not really pushing. And, and a lot of stuff in psychology where we see the big moments where we were really shaken up and saw new stuff happening. Mm -hmm. It was when you see people juxtaposing different theories, challenging mm -hmm. different perspectives, right? That's where we see kind of the, like the cognitive, cognitive revolution blew everything open, right? The cultural turn in the 1990s, the discursive turn that slightly preceded that also really blew open how we think because they involve mm -hmm. juxtaposing different big T philosophical worldviews. Mm -hmm. And so about the replication crisis, we've been talking here a lot about, uh, about uh, theorizing and theory. Does that connect in any way to the replication crisis? Oh, absolutely. And I, if anyone's interested, there's actually an interesting article in the Journal of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology, which of course I've a vested interest in, <laughs> all about this particular topic. <laughs> now, the... Uh, the replication crisis, in some ways, it represents a moment when our theory, our theoretical big T, big T theory isn't working, right? Because mm. we, we thought for sure that if we stuck with it, like the, the mode is that if you do your studies, you can build knowledge and then eventually you should be able to replicate them. And then it just didn't happen. We've got a weird paradox. Because a lot of the findings that we have in social psychology, they work. They work really well. 
And they work so well that places like Google or Facebook or other technology companies appropriate a whole bunch of these social psychology principles to mm -hmm. manipulate our interest in their technology. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yet they're not replicating. <laughs> <laughs> and they should be. <laughs> like, I mean, so we have something that works really well, but it doesn't replicate. The studies aren't replicating. For example, you, you take the famous stuff on, um, on priming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, boy, pr priming works all the time, and then suddenly you get these studies that aren't working, that aren't replicating. These famous priming studies aren't replicating. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we're at a point where our theory isn't working. There's something going wrong, and so the replication crisis actually really signals not necessarily the idea that we should now use more data and do more. Um, more uh, more studies, but rather we need to rethink mm -hmm. uh, kind of how we're shaping and understanding the work that we're doing, right? And rethink some of the kind of long-standing presuppositions about our work. Mm -hmm. And that's what the replication crisis is calling us to, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I am uh, I want to be very careful here and yeah. give a shout out. I am so thankful for the amount of work that's going into data transparency and making data available when we do studies for other people to look at. This is, uh, this is just brilliant. I'm so thankful for that. But that's not the only solution. The replication crisis, of, of course we're going to see studies not replicate. The reason, one of the main reasons is culture changes. So your research, if it's predicated, let's say you do some research in the 1970s, and it's based mm -hmm. on a whole bunch of assumptions about how the world works and language, about how the world works, that sort of thing. Um, take, for example, the Beck Depression Inventory. Classic measure of depression. I can't remember, was it 40 years ago it was developed? Uh, 50 years ago? If you give it to people today, there's a bunch of weird words in there that don't make sense. And so the Beck Depression Inventory, of course, it's not going to replicate as well because the culture has changed and the words have changed, right? And, mm -hmm. um, Research is so deeply embedded in the community and the, world, the split place that it is that, of, of course, it's going to be hard to replicate something 40 years later because human psychology has changed. Like our mm -hmm. psychology, the way we think is always integrated with technology. The clock changed how we think forever. Written word changed how we think. Current technologies like apps, right, the phones we engage with, mm -hmm. of course they're changing how we think. So, of course, human psychology is changing. It's not so static right and the replication crisis is pointing out how we have to pay very close attention to these changes and it calls for important theorizing but but that's the thing right because i guess that in this case we also have to get a better understanding of uh how important replication itself is and also what we should expect uh, to replicate and in what contexts and situations because as uh, you mentioned culture there and I would imagine that for example if we have if we are studying a particular psychological phenomenon uh, with uh, in a particular setting for example in a weird country and, oh, yes, of course. and we try the same thing in a non-weird country and it doesn't replicate I mean, that doesn't automatically mean or necessarily mean that the initial study wasn't identifying something uh, real, correct? It's just yeah. that uh, it doesn't translate well into the second uh, context, for example. Yeah. Right. Exactly, yeah. And in many ways, what I'm trying to get at is that... Um, Within a particular, let's, you say weird, which is white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> okay. what we're talking about. The acronym yeah, yeah, yeah. from Joe Henrik and his collaborators. And yeah. Heine and so forth, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the, in a weird country, you were talking about a certain big T theory about how the world works, how the mind works. And you yeah. go to another culture, which is not weird. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> of course, it's not going to work because you have a, it's a different philosophical understanding of the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, someone who's articulated this very well is Sunil Bhatia, uh, B-H-A-T-I-A. 
in his book uh, Decolonial Psychology. It came out in 2018, and it was it's an excellent articulation of why and how this happens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, I would also like to ask you about something that you've already mentioned a few times in our conversation statistical mm -hmm. positivism as a, a theory of how to do science so what is it really about and what do you think are perhaps some of its drawbacks and limitations sure now before i start i just want to make it uh, really clear there is a lot of long several hundred year history talking about positivism <laughs> so <laughs> so i'm not gonna do it justice in in, in 35 seconds Fair enough. but in general uh really broadly speaking in a very perhaps too sloppy way positivism is how we make posits or scientific statements about how the world works mm -hmm. right now we um i may posit a law of gravity right that's mm -hmm. things fall a certain rate and I, and then i I'll, I'll make some sort of observation to see if my posit holds holds uh true i'll drop something and see if it falls Right. And mm -hmm. we do that in psychology, too. We posit that we process information in certain ways. Um, and uh, what we do then is we make observations to see if our posit is held, holds true. Or, and that's roughly speaking, that's positivism. Mm -hmm. So what happened in psychology was we managed to get computational power, which meant we could then calculate statistically a whole bunch of stuff. In mm -hmm. particular, we could then use statistics to assess our, posit, our posits or our scientific hypotheses. So statistical positivism is where psychology is largely landed, which is using statistics. It's a kind of brand or, or subgenre of positivism to test our posits. And that's, that's, it's a fine approach and it's got us a lot of good stuff, right? It's helped psychology, it's helped therapy, it's helped lots of people. It's been used by apps and so on and so forth, the principles that we found through this method. So we don't want to throw it out. And we see a long history of that in psychology. We have something that we really love, like statistical positivism, and then something comes along, let's say social constructionism, and we just throw out positivism. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we have to, we have to, we don't want we want to be very careful we don't kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, okay? mm -hmm. so I'm not advocating throwing something out, but I am advocating noting that in current conversations, there are some problems with positivism, and statistical positivism in particular. Now, there's lots of people that are talking about the problem of statistics, uh, but there's also an important to realize that statistics, like all measurements, are representations. And how we interpret what those representations mean comes out of our big T theory. And so the problem with statistical positivism in psychology is that it's been kind of quiet about how the big T theory can shape our interpretations, right? So if I, um, if I do a study, uh, I'll just use again, uh, sorry, this gender binary is such a good example about males versus females. Already I've set up a kind of binary mm -hmm. and, and then my tests are predicated on that binary, right? Yeah. I've now excluded a whole bunch of people who might be you know, not heteronormative. And in fact, there's a brilliant article by a gentleman named Thomas Teo, T-E-O, and it's, it's about epistemic violence. And it's a very strong term, but epistem means knowledge and violence means to do damage to. Mm -hmm. And he catalogs how psychology has done damage to certain marginalized groups through our commitment to statistical positivism. Right, like our best mm -hmm. science at the time told us we should sterilize a bunch of people. <laughs> our best, you know, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, current work is pointing out how statistical positivism generates ideas that are then transported, for example, to India, and it's causing problems. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So what uh, what Teo is calling for when he's talking about epistemic violence is to pay closer attention to how the knowledge you generate can actually have an impact and what impact it has. To understand that impact, you have to be much more transparent about what you think your numbers or statistics in this case mean. And mm -hmm. what he's arguing for, a lot of critics are arguing for, uh, 
is saying statistical positivism has not been sufficiently careful or reflective about the impact of the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So one last question then. We talked about the replication crisis. What about the inclusion crisis? What sure. does that mean exactly? <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, uh, again, the inclusion crisis is a term that I made up. I'll be fully transparent there because I want to address an issue. Mm -hmm. And when we look over the history of psychology, we see certain crises. We see this crisis of social psychology that I talked about. We see the crisis, uh, replication crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I also argue that there was a cultural crisis in the 1990s when we realized a lot of our stuff, like you talked about, weird to non-weird cultures didn't work. Mm -hmm. The inclusion crisis is a term that I'm using to describe the kind of conversation psychologists find themselves in. That is, marginalized voices are saying, we want to be recognized. You know, non-heteronormative communities want to be recognized, right? The Black Lives Matter movement was saying, look, we need to be recognized and included meaningfully. Mm -hmm. uh, feminist critiques for the last 35 years have been saying we want to be included. We see now a kind of big move on decolonial and post-colonial psychologies and indigenous psychologies saying we want to be included. And I call mm -hmm. this a crisis because it's pushing psychologists to rethink their big T theory. And so I call it the inclusion crisis in a way, on the one hand, it's very positive because we're trying to grapple with and deal with new groups and grapple with um, kind of really important conversations about people who have been marginalized and ostracized so on and so forth. Um, it, it's a good thing, but it's also throwing us into crisis because like I mentioned earlier, we're having to have conversations that psychologists might not be trained in. Right? If I talk about my, to my colleague, a lot of them about, hey, you know, an indigenous ontology is completely different than the research you're doing. And I was in a research seminar not too long ago where someone had given a bunch of studies to indigenous students. And then they got just bonkers results. <laughs> the results are completely <laughs> uninterpretable. <laughs> and and I, I said, well, that's because you're trying to use your paradigm, a statistical positive paradigm with indigenous students. Indigenous people yeah. and th their perspective, their orientation is just different. So you're asking them nonsensical questions. So of course you got nonsensical data, right? <laughs> and I call it a crisis because psychologists are pushed into having those conversations that some of us might not be ready for. Okay, great. So uh, Dr. Cresswell, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Of course. So I teach at Ambrose University. And mm -hmm. people are welcome to go to the Ambrose site and find a list of my work. Um, they're also very well, very welcome to reach out to me with questions, comments, existential concerns. I don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> I'm very happy to take the time. And, uh, and that's, that's the best place to kind of find my work. I'm very happy to uh, connect with folks. Great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. And I really love talking talking to you. So. Oh, you're very gracious. Thanks so much, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Whittingbird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Philip Forrest Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Tiago Dunes, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, 
João Leira, Tam Amal, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adan Arusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hallman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Panos Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichlin, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Steofanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Holt Erickson, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassy, Tom Roth, The RPMD, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.